Hi everyone, uh, welcome to today's uh, apologies, slightly delayed and a bit different uh, training session. Sorry again about uh, uh, this morning. Um, it's going to be one of those days, I think, because uh, uh, not only did we have all the boiler issues, um, but as I logged into Zoom, um, Zoom is now deciding it won't, it will switch off my microphone every time I exit the Zoom options window. So I'm having to keep it open in the background. I'm hoping that does the trick, uh, but I've instructed Elliot to shout at me if you can't hear me uh, at any point. And uh, if for whatever reason it decides to, uh, I can't seem to hear you, then if you all shove your hands up, um, uh, on the uh, on the sort of emoji thing, I, I should I should I should see it. So uh, apologies, I I tried rebooting Zoom, it wasn't having it, and the only thing that seems to work is to keep it open in the background. So it's going to be one of those days, I think. But nonetheless, we will we'll plow through. Uh, so thank you for coming along at such uh, short notice um, this afternoon. I thought it worthwhile just to at least get through um, some of the stuff we were going to do. Um, potentially, uh, so we'll sort out the the, the, the sort of second half of this session uh, when we're going to do that. Uh, potentially we might look at doing that uh, next Tuesday afternoon. I can't do the morning, uh, but I could probably do it as the afternoon session. Appreciate not everybody will be able to make it, but I think um, it might be easier for uh, those of you who aren't on leave, uh, etc., or got other commitments um, to make a, at least a, a, a Tuesday than, than another day. But um, uh, most of the sort of the core teaching stuff um we should be able to get through this afternoon um but uh, uh it, it, if you don't manage to make that other session it would be worth um having a go at uh, using this um uh, package that we're going to talk about today so um today we're going to talk about um uh, agent-based simulation last week we talked about um cellular automata um as being a uh, a type of agent-based simulation a very kind of pure the the most pure type of agent based simulation um but uh it has a lot of restrictions and it's 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 kind of quite abstract um but can be quite useful um and um hopefully you may have checked out um uh, a couple of the links that were floating around about some potential ideas that you can uh, sort of practical stuff that you can you can do with cellular automata but it is more likely if you're going to be doing anything agent based um that uh you would probably not do a a cellular automata based um uh, project um you might uh and that'd be fascinating to see but you're more likely uh to do something uh that fits more with what we're doing today um and you'll see that actually agent-based simulation a lot of the principles that we saw last week uh, are, are the kind of core principles of agent-based simulation but really with an agent-based simulation unlike a lot of the methods that we've shown you you can pretty much do anything um and you'll see a lot of that flexibility so it's it, it, it there's some sort of core concepts and then you can just build anything around that so it's much more flexible actually um than a lot of the uh, a lot of the approaches that that we show you so um we're going to use a, a package today um called a mesa um which is a fantastic package um a python based package um that allows you to build agent based simulations now agent based simulations I think Mesa is actually pretty easy to use. Um, uh, it's not, I don't think it's as difficult even as SymPy because SymPy you have to sort of know a little bit about generator functions and it's got a bit of a weird sort of framework. Once you get your head around it, it's okay. But Mesa is just built around the idea of object oriented programming. And uh, obviously we've covered object oriented programming and this is a good practice for object oriented programming. And it's just pretty much standard object oriented programming but it has certain key classes that we can inherit um, that make our life easier uh, and we use those but we still write everything as sort of classes and attributes and, and, and methods within those classes so um, if you get used to the object oriented framework uh, uh, programming framework mace is really easy to use similarly mace is actually really handy and agent-based simulation more generally for practicing object oriented programming so they, they sort of help each other out it's quite a nice way to um, get used to it and we found a lot of people actually with with this uh, particular session uh, it helps them to understand object oriented programming because it makes sense uh, in in agent based simulation that that's kind of a really good fit for object oriented uh, programming so um we we talked a little bit about uh, last week about what object um what agent based simulation is um and we said that it's basically a, a simulation method that focuses on behavior that's that's the key thing and specifically it's looking at behaviors interactions um, and uh, motivations of individuals within a system um, and what we're trying to do is observe the kind of population level emergent behavior that arises from 
individuals within a system behaving and interacting in certain ways. So as we mentioned last week, it's very commonly used um, in ecology, ecological modeling. We model uh, forager behavior is very, very common. Um, typically in, a, in ecology, it's known as um, individual based modeling, IBM. Uh, but outside of ecology, um, well, actually in computer science, uh, it used to be known as IBM as well. But um, elsewhere, uh, agent-based simulation is, is the most widely term used. Um, very often used for uh, modeling uh, disease spread, um, outbreaks in public health. Um, and as we talked about last week, it's a little bit different to kind of conventional uh, mathematics. So what are the um, sort of core elements um, of an agent-based simulation? Uh, well, we've got agents, uh, which are our sort of principal, a bit like entities in our discrete event simulation. Agents are, are kind of our entities of interest within an agent-based simulation. And these are the things that are uh, moving and interacting and behaving in some kind of environment. OK, so you've got agents who are doing things within an environment. And at the individual level, between these agents, we've got um, each agent uh, behaving in a certain way, doing things, perhaps interacting with the environment, perhaps interacting with each other. Um, and typically they'll have some kind of motivation, um, something they're, they're trying to achieve. Um, and the thing we're interested in really from an agent-based simulation is uh, the emergent behavior, um, which is the outcome. That's what we're, we're interested in observing. We're looking at programming uh, uh, behavioral rules at an individual level and then seeing how that plays out uh, at, at a population or, or system level. So um, I won't go over this in detail because we, we, we covered this a lot last week, but obviously we talked about um, cellular automata being a, a, a type of agent-based simulation, albeit a very uh, a sort of quite rigid and pure example of one. Um, and the most famous example of that being uh, John Conway's uh, Game of Life or life as it's uh, commonly known. You had a bit of a uh, play around with that uh, last week. But in that those situations, we were just looking at essentially cells and then very simple rules, and there was kind of no memory involved. It was just, well, if things look like this, uh, if your cell is in this state in this generation, then it'll be, be in this state in the next generation. So very simple behavior rules. But nonetheless, we, we saw that even from those very simple structures, we got this fascinating uh, complex emergent behavior uh, emerging. And the same holds true for agent-based simulation more generally, that typically we can put in very simple behavioral rules, but actually that can lead um, to really interesting uh, stuff happening um, at a population level. Um, so uh, if, you, if you're interested in, uh, I mentioned that it's quite widely used in uh, ecology. There's a fantastic uh, book here uh, by uh, an esteemed um, academic, uh, a bargain price of just £69 um, on Amazon. Uh, this book has sold um, uh, over one copy um, in, in the last uh, 11 years. In fact, to be more specific, uh, two copies. Um, I'd love to meet uh, those people who, who bought this, um, but I, I think it's fair to say it's been flying off the shelves. Um, you, if, you, if you can, of course, read my thesis uh, online, and I will share a link to that completely free of charge. Um, but uh, if, you, if you'd like the feel of uh, a book and having the, 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 the sensation of uh, turning the pages of a real book, well, then you can't beat, um, you just can't put a price on that. Well, you, well, you can, it's £69 apparently on Amazon, um, which is quite expensive. Uh, but it does have a, a fantastic picture of me that's slightly morphed at the, uh, and, and uh, uh, slightly ridiculously sized and looking young and um, as though I'm, I'm hip and cool, which I'm very much not. But just to give you an overview, uh, so I touched on this last week uh, that I did an agent-based simulation as part of my PhD many moons ago, um, and that was in in, in uh, ecology, ecological modelling, um, and it was building this uh, system known as Harvest, um, which is for harvesting animals, reinforced values and estimates, and it basically combined um, agent-based simulation with uh, principles of reinforcement learning, uh, which we'll touch on uh, uh, at the very end of, uh, or towards the end of the uh, the training phase. Um, but the, the idea of this uh, um, was to build a model, an agent-based simulation model, of the way in which uh, bumblebees forage uh, within a landscape, how they're making individual level decisions, um, and how that plays out, specifically looking at what is the potential risk that due to the way in which individual bees forage, 
is there a risk of GM to non-GM cross-contamination from these kind of significant pollinators? Um, it turns out, by the way, the model predicts there isn't. Um, and it's mainly because bees are risk averse and they uh, tend to stay within patches of flowers, uh, within fields um, for quite a long time before they decide to move. Um, and because of that, the the any sort of GM pollen gets um, diluted. Um, so you have a dilution effect. Um, but basically, the, the, the model is fairly simple. You had these um, individual agents, our bees. Um, they, they had a goal, a motivation, which was to fill up with nectar or food as quickly as possible. So trying to get as many units of nectar as quickly as possible. That approximates what they do in the real world. They need to, they're energy motivated. Um, they need to fill up um, and they need to be constantly consuming food. Um, and they basically just make a choice uh, at every time step of the model of, um, do I stay in the current field and sample a flower here? Or do I move to another field, but I incur a travel cost for doing that and therefore a cost, an energy cost in this case. Um, and the bee is maintaining um, an estimate of uh, how full, how good each field is. Um, and obviously that that may or may not differ from uh, what the reality is in terms of how much food there is. Um, but uh, it turns out that they're, they're pretty good reinforcement learners. And we'll touch more on this uh, when we come to the reinforcement learning session later in the course. Um, but they're basically, if they, if they sample a flower, they get some food uh, or they don't get some food. So there's a binary outcome. If they get some food, then their estimate of the current field improves. Um, whereas if they don't, then it then it sort of decreases, diminishes. Um, and essentially just making simple comparisons. Do I think it's worth moving to another field or should, should I stay where I am? Um, so it kind of uses that reinforcement learning with the agent-based simulation. In this case, the agents, the bees didn't interact with each, each other because bumblebees, are solitary foragers, unlike um, honeybees, which is a very different beast, um, where they do the whole sort of waggle dance thing and uh, um, uh, indicate where they should be foraging. But uh, bumblebees, there's some uh, evidence they, well, we know that they trap line, um, which is where they follow the same route um, through uh, both the patch of flowers and uh, across the landscape. Um, uh, uh, and they, 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 there's some evidence that they follow pheromones in order to do that. But generally speaking, their, their foraging motivations are um, typically individual based. But that's an example of the kind of individual based model you often see in sort of ecological modeling. Okay, so let's talk about um, MESA. So MESA is a, a Python based framework uh, to build agent based simulations, much as uh, SimPy is a Python based framework for uh, developing discrete event simulations. It's free and open source, of course it is. We only teach free and open source stuff on this course. Um, and it's got fantastic uh, visualization capabilities. And you'll see a glimpse of that uh, today, uh, that it's got some really nice built-in uh, ways to visualize a model, which is really important in an agent-based simulation uh, because they're very visual things, uh, much as um, uh, geographic models are visual beasts because they're all about maps. And uh, Elliot uh, will talk to you more about that in the new year. Um, but agent based simulations, very similarly, are, are very visual. And you saw a glimpse of that with the cellular automata stuff last week, um, how visual these things are. And Mesa actually makes it really easy to put together um, uh, models um, uh, fairly quickly, actually. And you'll see that today. Um, that you can put together quite complex models um, uh, and it's already got the kind of framework built in for you. So it defines what an agent is, it defines what a model is, uh, it automatically you know, sort of sets up the framework to allow you to visualize the stuff. So all you've got to do is say what you want to happen in, in your particular model. Um, so hopefully you've, all, um, oops, hopefully you've all pip installed that, uh, just pip install Mesa on that one. So let's talk a little bit about, uh, before we look at the code, uh, about how uh, Mesa is structured. So if we're building a model in Mesa, then we tend to have um, three modules, possibly two, depending on how we run it, but we usually write the third anyway. And by modules, remember these are just .py files. So this is, uh, we can think of this as having three .py files in our directory. So the main one is the model. The model module um, and this one's basically going to contain all the interesting stuff describing how the model works so in the model module uh, we will have a class uh, of every type of agent that we want in our model 
Um, a lot of models will only have one type of agent, um, but you can have more than one. There's nothing stopping you doing that, and some models will. Um, and uh, each of your agent uh, uh, classes will contain uh, any relevant attributes for that agent, uh, a constructor method, because remember, it's object-oriented programming, so we need to specify how to set them up when one of these is uh, created. Um, we have uh, various methods which define the things the agent can do. Remember, in an agent-based simulation, our agents move and they do other stuff. And so that's where we write methods that say, here's how you move and here's how you do your other stuff. And so we can have as many methods as we want to describe all that other stuff. And we also have a step method. Um, so that's a method that we do need. And that basically just says, um, this is the uh, list of actions that when it's your turn uh, as the agent in the model, um, when it's your turn to do something, this is what you will do. And this is the order in which you will do it uh, for each time step. So we have one of those uh, for each agent, um, but we're only gonna have a single agent model uh, today. Um, then we have a separate class which represents our model, and that basically contains any relevant model attributes. This is all very common to, to object-oriented programming. Again, a constructor to set up the model. And this also has a step method, and that defines model-wide what happens at every time step of the model. OK, so the agent step method says you as an agent, this is the, the series of things you will do in the model uh, class. This says um, as the model, this is the series of things you need to do per time step. And then we may have outside of these classes, uh, we may have some uh, functions uh, to calculate various results. And we'll see some examples of that in the session as well. And that's basically where we where most of the work is done in here. And you'll see how Mesa makes this actually very easy for us to do this. We then have a separate uh, module, separate.py file uh, called the run module. This uh, basically defines how our model will run. And there's basically three main options. You can either run the model as a single run, as a batch of runs. And um, you'll see Mesa's got some really nice functionality that says, I want to try out all of these different combinations of things um, try these different combinations of parameter values, run each combination X number of times for X number of time units, and it goes away and it does it for you. It's really nice. Um, so unlike SimPy, where you have to sort of specify all that manually, um, here you can you can do this uh, automatically using just a few lines of code. It's really, really nice. Um, oh, the third option, though, is the one we'll start with um, today, uh, which is where we can um, uh, see a live visualization of the model so we can watch the model play out in front of our eyes and whilst you wouldn't tend to use that you know when you're using the model to get out some results you would use that a to uh, see how the model's working as you're developing it up and also to show to your stakeholders so they can see how the model's working um, so it's a really powerful visualization tool and it's really neat so if we in the run module uh, we basically just have um, uh, a couple of different bits of code depending on what we want to do uh, which of those kind of three options we want. Um, if it's the uh, third option to, to go with the live visualization, which is what we'll do first of all today, then we also need this third module, which is uh, we only need if we're going to do that visualization stuff. Um, so a third uh, module file, uh, module.py file. Um, and basically this one will launch a server uh, so that we can, on, on your local machine, um, and uh, it will send data to, to JavaScript, uh, which will then draw the model live in a web browser, and you can watch it in your browser play out in front of your eyes. And we'll see how you can do that, and it's really easy to do that. And so, uh, as I say, each of these three uh, lives in a separate.py file, and we basically just import the bits of the things that we need into each. Okay, so let's um, let's have a look at Mesa, and let's uh, before we do that, let's let's uh, get an understanding of the uh, problem that we're going to tackle uh, uh, and code in our our, our our Mesa framework. So let's imagine we've been asked uh, to model the spread of a new disease. Okay, so the disease is uh, spread uh, through close contact um, with individuals, and the probability of someone catching the disease after coming into contact with an infected individual, which is known as the transmissibility, uh, is 20%. And the disease lasts on average uh, for 10 days. So we've got people coming into contact with each other 
uh, potentially uh, passing on uh, the disease uh, and the disease lasts on average for 10 days, although it vary uh, according to the um, individual. So what we're going to do is we're going to use MESA to build a model of the spread of this disease within a population. Uh, and we've got very simple individual level rules that we can put in and we're going to see how that then sort of spreads out. So check that. So the first thing we're going to do uh, is we need uh, to write our uh, model file. So I've called mine uh, diseasemodel.py. And of course, as ever with any Python code, the first thing we need to do uh, is import the libraries that we're going to need. Um, so here, uh, my imports are uh, from, uh, mostly from Mesa. Uh, so from Mesa, uh, we're not going to import everything. Uh, we're going to import the stuff we want. So I'm going to import the um, uh, classes agent and model. Uh, agent, the agent class allows us to define an agent um, and the model class allows us to define the model. So those are the two core ones you'll need for any uh, agent-based simulation. Uh, then uh, from mesa.time, I'm going to import something called random activation. This is the uh, um, class that will determine the order in which agents move. We'll come back. Uh, um, uh, we'll come back to that in a bit. We're also from uh, mesa.space. We've got mesa.time. This is a mesa.space. Uh, we're going to import uh, a uh, something called a multigrid. Basically, that just means they're going to live their environment. Remember, agents live in an environment. And the environment they're going to live in is a grid, and it's what's known as a multi-grid. And that basically means we can have more than one agent per cell. And that's how we're going to define people being close to each other in close proximity. If they're in the same cell, there's a chance that infected people can infect other people. Uh, and then we're going to import something called um, uh, the data collector for Mesa.data collection. We'll come back to that. Uh, don't worry about that for a moment. Um, we'll also import the random library because that's useful when we're doing a lot of modeling, as we've already seen in SymPy, uh, to be able to um, uh, generate random numbers uh, from various distributions. OK, so th those are our imports. Then we need to write the agent class. We need to define our agent. And we're just going to have in our model a single type of agent called person, okay? That's that's the type of agent we've got. We've just got one in our model and it's a person class. So we're gonna have lots of persons or people uh, who are basically walking around and interacting with each other. So in our agent class, we're gonna have uh, multiple functions that define what the agent does. So we'll have a function that will move the agent around the environment. We'll have a function that infects other people if they're infected. And we'll have a function um, that will define all the things that we need to do at each tick of the clock, at uh, each time unit. That's our step function, if you remember. But of course, this being uh, object oriented programming, the first function we need to define is our constructor in it, our dunder method. So in the constructor, we're basically going to define this is uh, when you create, when I ask for a new agent of type person, when I want a new person, this is what I need you to set up to assemble a new person for me. Um, so in the constructor, we're going to specify uh, the uh, transmissibility. Remember, that's the probability that an agent will infect another uh, agent. Uh, the level of movement of the agent, which is basically going to be the probability that at any time unit they move. Uh, the average disease duration. Um, and whether or not the agent is infected at the start of the model, um, according to some kind of probability that we specify, because we want some of our agents to be infected at the start. Otherwise, we'll have a very boring model um, because we'll just have a model where none of the agents are infected and we just watch as there is no disease. So it's not very interesting. We need, we're going to need at least some, we need at least one person uh, to be infected uh, at the start of our model. OK, so let me switch over uh, to Spider, as it'll probably be uh, I can uh, play around with the, uh, the screen a bit better. So, uh, OK, so we've got, that's our imports. We've already seen that. So let's scroll down here. So um, we're going to write our person class, our person agent um, class. I've called mine person agent. I've only got one type of agent in this model, but I might add more. Um, so uh, I've called it a person agent, just in case uh, I want to create any more types of agent in my model. So uh, remember, we call it, uh, we use the class keyword, give it a name, uh, person agent in this case. Now, uh, hopefully you remember from your object-oriented programming, 
uh, that we can do something called inheritance uh, in uh, object-oriented programming, which means we can say this class here that I'm writing, it's one of those just with some extras. Inherit all the things from this parent and I'll just give you some extras on top. And this is what we're doing here. So we're basically saying Mesa already has a class for an agent that defines, so we don't have to write from scratch what an agent is. We can just say it's an agent. Um, so we inherit agent. So remember if in a class definition, if we put in another class name, I remember we've imported the agent class from, uh, uh, from Mesa. Um, if we put that into brackets um, uh, as an input to that class, then they'll say, okay, the, this person agent thing you're writing, that's a class that's a child of the agent class. So it'll automatically inherit all the stuff that it knows about uh, an agent class. So now our person agent is one of those. It's just we're going to chuck on some extra stuff on top. And that'll be all the stuff that's unique to our particular agent. So we set up our, our constructor and uh, remember this is the bit that uh, the super uh, method we're here where we call super, I call the um, constructor on super. Uh, and that basically says, run the constructor on the parent class. So it'll set up um, an agent uh, object uh, as defined by Mesa. So we'd have to do all that. The things I'm gonna pass in here, remember we have to pass in self, this is object oriented programming. So that'll be the copy of, this, whenever a new um, agent person agent is created, that will be where it's stored, this particular person. Uh, I'm going to pass in, I need to pass in two things that I must pass in, one of which is a unique ID uh, and the other is a model. So um, those two things are fundamental because the uh, agent class that's written by Mesa that we're inheriting from we have to have those two things. It needs uh, an ID, some sort of ID for the agent, um, and it needs to be told in which model is it going to live. Those are the two fundamental pieces of information it needs. So we will pass those things in. When we create a new person agent, we will tell it, give it this ID, and this is the model in which it lives. We've only got one model here, so that's nice and simple. The other things we're going to pass in, uh, we're going to pass in this the, the stuff we said we would. So an in initial infection, uh, probability, um, the uh, transmissibility, so uh, the probability that if they're infected, they infect someone else, uh, the level of movement, the probability that they will move on any given time step, and the mean length of disease. On average, how long does somebody have this um, condition? So the first thing we'll do is we'll call the constructor uh, on the on the parent, on the agent class, and just say, yeah, do all that. And by the way, here's the unique ID you need, and here's the model in which you live. So we do that, and that's why we pass those in first. Once we've done that, we can do all the extra stuff that's unique to our particular model. Um, so we will uh, set up an attribute called transmissibility, and we'll set that to the transmissibility that's been passed in. We'll set up an attribute called level of movement, and again, we'll set that to whatever value was passed in. And we'll do the same thing for mean length of um, disease. Now for the other one, uh, which is uh, the initial infection, Basically, all we need to do here, this is the initial infection, is the probability that at the start of the model, any agent we create is already infected. So what we'll do here, we'll just do a very simple uh, piece of conditional logic where, and we've seen this lots of times before now, we'll sample from a random um, uh, uniform distribution, take a random number from a uniform distribution, and if it's less than whatever that probability is, then we'll say that thing has come true. So if there's a 20% chance that they're infected at the start of the model, then uh, we, if the random number is between 0 and 0 0.2, then essentially we'll say, okay, this agent is, is infected at the start. And so what we'll do, if that's true, we'll set up a little attribute called infected, which will just be a Boolean. So each agent will have a Boolean that will either be true or false to indicate whether they're infected or not at any point in time. So if they're infected at the start of the model, we'll set that to true. Uh, as soon as they're created. And the other thing we need to do is to work out how long they're going to have um, this uh, this disease for, because the average is, is uh, 10 days, but uh, different people will recover in different ways. So we're just going to sample this using an exponential distribution here, much as you you, you've seen before um, in, uh, in in SymPy. Uh, but of course, you can use anything here. Um, doesn't matter how, how you however you want to do this. 
Um, so uh, I'm going to set up another attribute called disease duration. So the the um, each agent will essentially carry around a piece of information that will say, I'm going to have this disease for another seven days or whatever it may be. OK, so we'll work out how long they're going to have it. We're going to randomly sample that. We'll take the uh, the mean, so one over the mean for an exponential distribution. Uh, we've passed in the mean, the mean length of disease. And we've actually got that set up now as an attribute. So we'll say one over uh, that mean, sample from that. And I need to round that because I can't have a floating point number of days because in my model, my time units are going to represent days. So I can only have whole days worth. So I'll randomly sample and then I'll just round it to the nearest integer. So if we get out an 8.6 here, then it'll round that. And, and suddenly we've got uh, nine days um, that this person will have the disease. Uh, if it's determined, however, that they're not infected at the start, then we'll just set this in, uh, infected attribute that they're carrying around with them to false until they are infected. So that's all we do in the constructor. We call the, um, the constructor of the parent of the agent uh, class in Mesa, uh, passing in the unique ID that we're going to use for the agent and the model in which they'll live, and then set up whichever attributes we want, which in this case is our transmissibility, our level of movement, and our mean length of disease, and then whether they're infected at the start, and if so, um, how long they're going to have the disease for. Uh, right, go back here. So that's the constructor sorted. Next, we need to write uh, uh, some of our methods that will define how they move and behave. So let's start with movement. So our agents are going to move in our agent-based simulation because if they don't, again, it's going to be a pretty boring model because nobody's really going to get infected unless they happen to just be uh, uh, standing in the same place at the start and they start reinfecting each other. So they're going to move around in our model. So we're going to write a movement function that will specify how our agents will move around our environment, which remember is a, a grid of cells, uh, specifically a multi-grid, which means we can have more than one agent in, living in each cell. So in our model here, we just have a very simple movement rule. We're just going to say, uh, if an agent moves, then they'll just they'll move to one of the randomly selected neighboring cells. And we'll use a more neighborhood. Remember from last week, we said that's basically um, uh, more neighborhood is uh, the current cell plus all of the uh, eight surrounding cells, unlike a von Neumann, which would just be north, south, east and west. So they, they can go if they're going to move, they can go to any one uh, of those. So. The way in which we do that is actually very easy. We can use some shortcuts in Mesa. We find out what the possible movement locations are. Then we pick one at random, and then we tell the model, move the agent to that cell. Those are the three steps we go through. So again, let's switch over to Spider to have a look at this. So here's our, our move uh, method here. Uh, so I've just called it move. Um, so what we're going to do here, remember the first thing we need to do is say, well, what are the possible, so just to clarify, we're assuming if this method is called, the agent is going to move. They won't always move because we've got this level of movement probability that they'll move at any time step. But this method will only be called if it's decided this agent is going to move on this time step. Okay, so if this, if we get into this method, then we're assuming they're moving. So the first thing we'll do is we'll um, get a list of the um, possible cells uh, to which they could remo uh, remove, uh, move. Remember, we're using a, a more neighborhood, so it's basically any of the um, eight surrounding cells. Um, and we can use some shortcuts in, in Mesa to allow us to do this. Um, so we can use this um, uh, if we take the, uh, the model. So remember, we've got the model stored against the agent. So from the agents, uh, the model in which the agent lives, remember self is the agent, that's the class we live in. So it, this is basically saying, grab me the model uh, that I gave to you that you're living in. And from that, uh, we can get uh, dot grid dot get neighborhood. So uh, um, we use the uh, get neighborhood method of the grid. Um, and we can basically just get the neighborhood of any um, a agent living in our environment. And all we need to do is pass in 
the uh, location that we want the neighborhood for. In this case, that's my neighborhood. So it's wherever I am as the agent, this particular agent, wherever I am, that's the neighbor, the neighborhood that I want. Uh, so if we say self.pols, um, that basically just says, give, give that's my, my current location in the grid. We're going to, uh, we tell it the uh, neighborhood type that we want to use. So more equals true, because we want to use a more neighborhood. Um, and we don't want to include the center, because remember, a more neighbor technically includes the center cell. Well, the center cell is exactly where the agent is now. And if we've called this method, then we've determined the agent is going to move. So they can't stay where they are. So we can use this include center equals false. And that says, give me the neighborhood, but don't include where you are now. Because if you've got this far for calling this method, that agent is going to have to move to one of those cells. So um, if I call this just by passing in my location now, it's a more neighborhood I want, but don't include my current location. Um, then uh, uh, this will uh, basically get a list. So I store that in possible steps. That, those, that, that'll be a list of eight locations, my eight neighboring cells. All I need to do then is randomly pick one of those. Um, so I can use random.choice, pass in a list, and it'll randomly pick something from the list. So in this case, one of the cell locations. And I'll store that in new position. And then all I've got to do now is just tell uh, Mesa to move my agent to that new location, whichever one I've randomly selected. Um, so we can use the um, uh, move agent method of the grid uh, and all we need to do there is to pass in the agent that's going to move. In this case, it's me. It's me as an agent. So self. And uh, where I want to, uh, this agent to move. And that's the thing we've picked up here, new position. So we pass that in and we just call that method and Mesa will do the rest for us. It will say, OK, you want to move that agent, in this case, myself, to this new cell. So all the smooth methods doing is saying, grab me the eight neighboring cells uh, in a more neighborhood, don't include my current location, uh, then uh, randomly pick one of them and then uh, move me to one of those cells. That's it. So every time moves called, that's what it'll do. The other key thing that we want our, our agents to be able to do is to infect other people's. Um, so uh, in our model, people can infect others if they are themselves infectious. So we're going to need to write a function or a method, sorry, that will uh, define how this is going to work. So um, this is the way we're going to represent it in our model. And again, you could do whatever you like, but we're going to write it in this way. So we're going to say if a person is infected, because they have to be infected, if they're not infected, they can't infect anyone. But if they're infected and they're in the same location as non-infected people, then there is a probability that each non-infected person who's in that same location will be infected. Remember, that's the transmissibility, which we said is 20% for this disease. So the way we're going to do this is we're first going to get a list of all the agents in the current cell. If there's more than one agent in that cell, i.e. more than just me, so basically say, who... How many people are in my cell? And if there's more than one, then somebody else is here and it's not just me. Um, then if that's the case, we'll go through each agent in that cell. And if they're not already infected, then we'll randomly infect them with uh, by randomly sampling based on that probability. Um, and if we if we do infect them, much as we did when we set up a new agent, if they're infected at the start, then we'll also work out, we'll randomly sample how long they're going to have the disease for. Okay, so is there anybody else in the cell? If there is, go through every agent in the cell. If they're not infected already, then uh, randomly determine if, we're, if we're, I'm going to infect them. Now, we're technically going through every agent in the cell, which includes me. Okay, um, but of, of course, I, I, if this method is being call, uh, called, then I am infected and therefore I can't be reinfected. So it'll just skip over me. Okay, so let's have a look at the infect method. Let me scroll down. So here's our infect method. Um, so first thing I do, remember we wanna get uh, all of these, I've called them cellmates. 
So give me a list of all of the agents that are in this particular cell. So we can ask Mesa to do that. We say grid dot get, get cell list contents. And we pass in, we have to pass it in as a list. Um, uh, in this case, it's just a list with one location. Um, it'll tell you all of the agents that are in that cell. Now, in this case, we're saying it's wherever I am as the agent. So self.pols, remember, is where am I? Which, which cell am I in? So I pass that in. And that will give me a list of all of the agents that are currently in this cell. If it's just me in here, then we don't need to do anything else. But if there's more than just me, then uh, we need to potentially start infecting other people. So we'll check if the length of that list that's been returned is greater than one, i.e. it's more than just me in this cell, then uh, for each inhabitant in cellmates, i.e. for each of the agents that are, live, uh, that are currently in, living in this cell, then we're going to randomly determine whether they're going to get infected or not. Uh, now, we have to check first if they're infected uh, or not. If they're already infected, we're not going to bother. They're already infected. We can't reinfect them. But if they're not infected, then we'll randomly sample from the uniform distribution uh, and see if that comes out to less than the uh, transmissibility. So remember, 20%. We said the transmissibility for this disease. So if we get a value between 0 and 0 0.2, then we'll say this um, inhabitant, um, uh, this uh, particular agent in, is now infected and we'll randomly sample how long they'll have the disease for. So we do that for every agent. So if there's another, if there's me plus another 10 people in here, each of those other 10 people will have a, assuming they're not already infected, will have a 20% chance that they will now become infected. And that will happen in every time unit, in, in our case, every day of the model. Okay. So very simple method, grab me the list of agents that live in this cell, this could be any cell. We can pass in any position there. We just need to pass in a cell location. Uh, but in this case, I'm passing in my cell location as uh, me as the agent. See how many people we've got in there. If there's more than one, then uh, check, go through each one. If they're not infected, randomly infect them. And then if we do randomly infect them, uh, then work out how long they'll have the disease for. Okay, so we've defined our constructor. We said this is how I want you to create a new agent. Um, we've defined our movement method. We said this is how we want our agents to move around our grid, which basically is randomly, um, randomly pick a neighbor. And we've we've um, defined uh, their behavior, their infection behavior. We said if they're in a cell and there's other people with them, uh, then uh, potentially they're going to inf and they're infectious. Then potentially you're going to infect them too. Now, of course, in in our model, um, uh, depending on what you're doing, you could have anything. So here, we're, our behaviour is moving and infecting, but of course, your model could do absolutely anything you want. You can have your agents behaving in any way you like. You just write a little method and say this describes this behaviour. So when I say agent-based simulation, you can do anything. I do mean you can do anything. You're not bound by the rules of um, uh, cellular automata in this case, where you're saying, well, you, know, you basically have simple rules of on or off or in this state or not. Um, and you're not even bound by the rules of discrete event simulation, where you know you still have to have things queuing uh, for resource um, and you have an amount of time you spend on that resource. You haven't even got that. You can do anything you like with this stuff. So, but in our model, we've got movement and infection and our constructor method. Um, so we also need to specify, remember we said at the start, a step method. And that method is going to define at each time step of the model, in this case, days, each day of the model. Um, here's the series of things that I need you as an agent to do. So if we think about what we want ours to do, our agents might, uh, might move, they might not, but they might move. They might infect others if they're infected, and they might recover if they're infected because their the their disease duration may have elapsed. So what we're going to do, we're first going to check whether the agent is going to move on this time step. Based on remember, we've got a level of movement probability that we've set up, so we'll use that probability to determine: okay, is this agent going to move? 
then if the agent is infected then we'll call the infect function to check is there anybody else in this cell with me and if there is uh, I'll, uh, we need to infect them just as we've written in the infect function a moment ago and the other thing we need to do is decrement the if they are infected we need to say okay uh, the uh, the disease remaining disease duration for you has just ticked down by a day. You go, you're one day closer to being cured, or to no longer having the disease. So um, a little bit like um, some of the government COVID slogans, although perhaps not quite so catchy. Move, infect, get better is probably the opposite of what they wanted you to do. Um, but this is what we need to do in this model: Are we going to move? Are you going to infect? And you will gradually get better. So this is your, your first task. So I want you to uh, go into your groups and have a go at um, writing the step method. So I've given you this file, um, which is the uh, disease model um, x1.py file with everything I've just shown you. So we've got our agent class here and our import statements. So within the agent class, you're going to write another method, a fourth method, that will uh, be the step method. OK. And this will define what needs to happen, this move, infect, get better process. So what you should do, this um, method should first randomly determine whether the agent's going to move on this time step based on the probability that you've set up of this happening. If they are going to move, make that happen. Then you need to start infecting any other agents in the cell, but only if the agent is infected. Uh, and if the agent is infected, then you also need to uh, decrement their uh, remaining disease duration by, by one day. Also, if that then ticks down to zero uh, and the disease has now run its course, then you need to update. Um, uh, remember, we've got a Boolean set up in each agent saying, I'm infected, I'm not infected. That needs to be updated if the disease has now run its course too. So, um, the, the code don't overthink this the code is actually pretty straightforward this is mainly just to get you um uh, having a look at the code that i've just gone through making sure you understand it and then calling various bits of that in the right order so uh, once you've done this your code should run without errors but it won't appear to do anything because remember all we're doing at the moment is writing a, an agent class a, pay, a person agent class so um it won't do anything It'll, you're just writing this definition but it should run without errors so um, I'll give you about 20 minutes plus I'll sort of take a break in there. We'll see how we get on. But if we sort of come back about 22, quarter two, something like that, um, I will open up the breakout rooms. Um, obviously, because we've got we've got quite a few people here today. But um, if there are uh, if it's just you or just you and someone else in your group and you want to move into another group, feel free, uh, feel free. Just just, uh, you know, we'll all muck in today uh, because obviously this is a bit last minute. Um, so uh, if you, if you, certainly if you're on your own uh, in nobody else in your group is here today, then then please do join another group uh, and have a go at this. OK, I'll open up the rooms. Uh, let's see if Zoom crashes on me. No, it hasn't. Well, that's that's a first. Um, and uh, we'll float around and see if you need any help. Hi, everyone. OK, welcome back. Uh, so uh, apologies for the uh, confusion around um, screen sharing. I completely forgot to do that in the mad frantic rush uh, this afternoon and then ran off checking my boiler. Um, so uh, apologies for that. It should now work for the rest of the uh, the rest of the session. I got around to a few of the rooms. It seems like uh, most of you are on the uh, on the right lines um, with this, but I'll just go over the uh, solution. Uh, well done for those of you who spotted that the you already do have the uh, the solution in there, uh, because of course you've already got the uh, the, the complete file uh, as well. Uh, but uh, hopefully you had a go on your own too. So uh, let me share my screen uh, and let's bring up uh, no not that this. Okay, so um, the code's actually fairly straightforward. The main purpose of this was to get you understanding how you, uh, what we've written up above and how you're gonna call that essentially. So all we're gonna do in our step method, uh, which we've called step here, um, you're first gonna determine, am I going to move? As an agent, am I gonna move on this time step? So I'll just take a random number between zero and one. If that's uh, less than my, uh, level of movement that I've got stored, which remember is the probability that I will move on any given time step, 
then I will move and I'll just call my move method and that will move me. Um, then once I've determined uh, that, regardless of whether I moved or not, um, I'm then going to potentially begin infecting cellmates, but only if the well, if there are other cellmates there, but that's for the infect method to decide. But um, if uh, this will only be called if I'm in, infectious myself. If I'm not infectious, then I'm not. I can't possibly infect anyone else anyway. So I'll first check if I if I am infected. If I am infected, then I'll call the infect method, and that will then see. Okay, is there anybody else in this cell with me? And then randomly infect those people too. Um, I then need to uh, decrement my remaining disease duration by one time unit, one day. Um, so I've got that stored. My disease duration attribute stores how long I've got left of this disease. So I'll take one off that. And then if the disease has now run its course, um, then I'm no longer infected. So I need to update. So I can now check and I'll see if my disease duration, it shouldn't get below zero. I put this, this in as a bit of a safety measure just in case something goes wrong. I've said if it's less than or equal to zero, um, then uh, I'll, I'll set my um, self-infected um, to false. And therefore the next time round, uh, on the next time step, assuming I don't get infected again, um, I will no longer be infected and therefore this bit won't happen. So fairly straightforward, the, the code is really just to get you uh, sort of used to using the, the various bits uh, in Mesa. Um, but that is basically our agent class. We have, we have defined uh, a, uh, a constructor, which has set up the attributes. We've defined a move method to define movement behavior. Then we've defined an infect method, which will define um, one of the things we want our agents to do, which is to infect people. And then the step method, which defines what's going to happen, which of these behaviors, which of these methods are going to be called and in which order. And that's basically all you need to do for any agent. You, you, have, a, you have a constructor and a step method um, and likely a movement method uh, and then some other behavioral methods. And you could have one as you have here or you could have lots. Depends what you want your particular agents um, to do. So Let's uh, let's continue. So we've written the agent class, the person agent class. We're now going to write the model class. That's the other class that we're going to need in our uh, in our Mesa code. Um, and the model is going to control um, the agents uh, and their environment in which they live, and it will control basically how the model is going to is going to work as a whole. Um, so again, we have to specify our constructor first because it's a it's a class, um, and we'll set up the number of agents. Um, the grid that they'll live in, uh, the schedule that determines the order in which those agents act, and the starting cells uh, for the agents. Now, why might the schedule be particularly important in this in this particular instance? Any thoughts? Is it so they're random because not everyone will be infected at the same time? Not quite. Um, so basically with, so what we're writing here is um, an agent based simulation in which, so you're, you're kind of, you're on the right lines, but basically the, um, our agents, their main behavior, uh, two behaviors are we move and we potentially infect other people. So the schedule, which determines the order in which agents move, is actually quite important here because if an agent is uninfected and you've got an agent that's infected and that agent that's infected moves into the same cell as the agent that's not infected, they will inf potentially infect that agent. So if they, if they get their turn first, they will move into that cell and potentially infect them. If the agent that's uninfected moves first, then they can move away uh, and potentially never get infected. So actually the, the, the order will matter to the individual agents here. Now, we don't have any data on you know, who's gonna move first in this particular model. So we're just gonna set it up randomly. We'll say the order is random, but that doesn't change the fact that it does matter. It will uh, impact things because the um, uh, the order in which agents take their turns will potentially change whether particular agents get infected or not. 
But we're just going to use a random um, scheduler for this, which will basically just work out and randomly decide who's going to move first, um, which if you've got no other data is probably your, 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 your sort of best shot on this. So let's have a look at um, the disease model class. Let me scroll down. Uh, can't fit this all on. So we'll just start with this bit first. So again, we're going to use inheritance here. So I've called mine disease model. Um, and we're inheriting from the model class of Mesa. So we pass in model and we say it's it, this class I'm writing here. It's a, it's a it's a agent based model. Um, then uh, in the we write our constructor. Actually, before we start that, you'll see here I've got a, a comment uh, in. Uh, remember, this is a way in which we can write comments using triple quotation marks. That we can particularly use for multi line comments that everything is a comment. If you put three uh, double quotation marks there. Everything will then be a comment until you do the same thing to close it again. In Mesa, if we're using a server, which we're going to, to visualize it, if we put that comment just above, um, oh, as the first thing in our disease model, with the triple quotation marks, that message there will get picked up. Uh, and there'll be a little about button that you can click and whatever we've written there will then get printed out to the user as a little message. Uh, and we'll see that when we when we look at it. Um, so it's quite it's quite a nice little handy uh, thing where you can put information for the user there. So anyway, here's our here's our constructor. So into the constructor, we're going to pass self, obviously, because we always have to. Uh, we're going to pass um, uh, N. N is going to represent our number of agents. So we'll tell the um, uh, the model, when we create the model, how many agents it's going to have. Um, just to actually just pick up on a question that came up in one of the groups. So um, if you're wondering where all these numbers are coming from, because there doesn't seem to be any location where we're telling it how many agents or what the level of transmissibility is or anything at the moment, don't worry, we're coming on to that. Um, you, you haven't missed anything. We're going to get to that. And it's a little bit different to how we've been doing it. But we're gonna. We're, what we're saying here is when we when we tell it uh, we want a new model, we'll tell it how many agents we want. We'll give it a width and height uh, of our grid, our environment. So how many cells wide? How many cells high? Uh, we will pass in the initial infection, the transmissibility, the level of movement, and the mean length of the disease because it'll need those things when this class creates some agents for us because that's the stuff that will it'll need to create new agents. So the first thing we do in our constructor is we write this line of code. Um, we say self.running equals true. Um, you're probably wondering what that does. So it says of an attribute called running and we set it to true. Um, just know you need to put that in if you're going to use um, batch runner, which we probably won't come to today, but in the next session we will. Um, that batch runner is the thing that allows us to um, automatically try lots of combinations of our model and it'll go off and do them all for us. Um, if you're going to use that, well, I'd recommend you do it anyway, um, because you're probably going to want to use, uh, use that. Just make sure you put in that line of code, self.running equals true, as your first thing in your model constructor. And it, it just needs that to work. But then we're going to start setting up um, the stuff that is a bit more meaningful for us. Um, so we're going to set up a number of agents. I've called my num agents, and that'll be the value of n that we pass in. Um, then we're going to set up um, a grid uh, where our agents are going to live. Um, and we'll use the width and height that we passed in to set up that grid. Um, remember, we used um, uh, uh, we imported a multi-grid. So we're going to say we, we want one of those multi-grids. Multi-grid is just a grid in Mesa where you can have more than one agent per cell, which is important in, in our model because that's how people will get infected. Uh, so we say we want one of these multigrids. Now, this third argument here that says true, that says um, here we want it to be toroidal. Um, and basically toroidal means if you've got an agent that's uh, on a cell at the one of the borders, either the top, bottom, left or right, and they move towards the border. So let's say you've got an agent on the right, uh, on the right hand side, and they move to the right one cell then that means they'll come and appear on the left. So it wraps around. And the same with top and bottom. A bit like Pac-Man, essentially. Um, you may not always want that. So if you didn't want that, if you wanted your grid to represent, you know, these are actually edges, then you just change that to false. I can't remember if the default might be false, uh, but I would always 
put it in to 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 so you, you're clear whether it's toroidal or not. But in this instance, essentially our grid wraps around on itself. It's like a globe. So uh, you, if you keep going right, you'll just go wrap around and around. If you keep going up, you'll wrap around and around. As I say, it depends what you're modeling, what your grid represents. If you're just, so here we're just modeling an environment with, in which people are moving. Um, but it might be that your um, your grid represents something that's very specific. So you could set up a, a more elaborate structure. Uh, in fact, one of the groups last year tried to do something like that in one, in the, um, uh, what will be the second session for this now, um, uh, in when they built their own age based simulation, tried to set up a little structure where, you know, you could almost like a map where they could move in certain locations, um, emulating, you know, people moving around particular geographic constructs. So you can be as elaborate as you want, but we're just going to keep it simple for the moment because the principles remain the same. So we'll set up a grid. It's going to be a multi-grid with the width and height we pass it in, and it's going to be toroidal. Um, we're then going to set up a schedule. Remember, the schedule is the thing that's going to control all of the agents and uh, who acts when. So it'll say, you, you agent number 465, it's your turn to... to uh, do your thing, and then that, that agent step function will be called. Um, so uh, that step method that we just wrote a moment ago, where you wrote this series of things will happen, that's the thing that will be called for each agent on their turn. So this determines the turns. Um, and as I say, we're just going to have a random activation. So we, we imported that at the start, this concept of random activation. Uh, so we're going to import one of those, and that will be our scheduler. So this will just be It'll each time unit, it'll randomly pick the order in which the agents uh, behave. Um, so we set up our grid. Um, we've set up the um, uh, uh, the scheduler. Um, so what we're going to do here is now create the agents. And all we're going to do is we're going to just go around a for loop creating them. Um, and the number of times we go around the for loop will be defined by however many agents we want. So. Uh, we passed in a value n, which we then set up uh, in num agents as an attribute. So if we say we want 100 agents, this loop will run 100 times. And what it'll do in each uh, pass of the loop, it'll create a new person agent, one of those things we wrote up above. It'll create one of those. We're just going to call it A here. You can call it anything you like. Uh, now, we have to pass in those things uh, that a person agent needs. So if we remind ourselves what a person agent needs, the first thing it needed, um, other, let me scroll, sorry, I'm conscious not to go up and down too much, but uh, let's go back. So the first uh, uh, few things here, we always have to pass in uh, self, but we don't pass that across, okay? Remember, self stores the copy of the agent. So here, self means that's where I'll store me as an agent. But the, so the first two things that we need to pass across are the unique ID, the ID for that agent, and the model in which the agent will live. So down here, and I'm flagging this up for a reason because this can seem a bit confusing. First thing we need to pass in is the ID. So here I'm just going to use whatever I is in the loop. So the first agent will get an I value of zero, uh, an ID value of zero. Second agent will get an ID value of one. You can put in whatever you like there. I'm just using the, the loop because I'm not particularly interested in uh, creating a more elaborate uh, way of assigning IDs, but you might for your own model. So that's the ID. We'll just use whatever the um, index is for the loop. Then you're probably thinking, well, that's a bit weird. Why have you got self there? But think about it. OK, this is where it, 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 uh, it really gets you thinking about um, object-oriented programming. Remember, we are in the model class here. This is a method of the model class. It's the constructor for the model. So in here, self means the copy of the model class, not the agent. So what we're saying here is create a new agent and give to that the ID, just the index and the loop, and me, give it to me. I am the model in which it's going to live. So self here is myself as the model. So uh, that's what we're passing. Remember, that's what we set up uh, when we set up the person agent class. We said we give it an ID and then we'll give it the model in which it's going to operate. But well, the model here is me. So that's what we'll pass across. That could, it can seem a bit weird to get your head around, but if you, that might help you think about what self's actually doing. Because here, self is 
me as the model. Up above, self was, when we're in the uh, person agent class, self was me as the person agent. So here, me as the model, when I create a new agent, I'll give it to me. Then we're just going to pass across the other things that we uh, need to set up the agents, so the uh, probability that they're, they're initially infected, transmissibility, all that stuff. Um, so that will create a new person agent. That will set up their constructor. Whenever you call or create a new instance, it'll then call the constructor method. So it'll then set up the transmissibility and all that, and then it'll work out if they're um, going to be infected at the start and if they are, how long their disease duration, all that stuff we just wrote up above. So that agent will then be created, and then we're going to add that agent to the scheduler. So we uh, remember we've set up the scheduler as a random activation scheduler. So we say self.schedule, because it's now stored as an attribute of the model class, uh, dot add, and then we add the agent we've just created. So create the agent and then add it to the scheduler. Then what we're going to do is we want to um, put the agent somewhere in our grid. So what I've done here, and you can do this however you like, but I thought, well, what I'd like to do really is start people off so they're not all bunched together. So I've just put in a little piece of logic here that says, right, try finding an empty cell to store a new agent. So um, by default, we won't just pick any cell. We'll try and find a cell that's, that's empty so that people start as spread out as possible but of course if i've got more agents than cells then eventually i won't be able to do that um so i'm going to use a try accept statement here so i'm going to say try doing this uh try finding an empty cell and we can use the find empty method of the grid and it'll find you a random empty cell that doesn't have any agents in it and i'll use that as my start cell and then i'll call the place agent method of the grid and i'll pass in the agent I want to place, which is A, the one I created up here, and the start cell that I've randomly picked here. So it'll do that. And if there's an empty cell, it'll randomly find, find one and, and, and give that to you. However, if there isn't, this will throw up an error because there won't be any empty cell. So here we can use the try except to say, okay, well, if, if that throws up an error, then clearly there aren't any empty cells left. So then we'll run the code in except. And here, what I'll do, say, well, OK, in which case I'm now full. Uh, there are no empty cells. So what I'm going to do now, I'll just pick a cell at random. And I'll put them in there. Um, so uh, I randomly pick an X coordinate and a Y coordinate. Um, and uh, the I basically use the rand range, a method of random, where you can pass in uh, a range, um, a value, and it'll pick a number between 0 and that number. Um, so here, that'll pick a number between zero and whatever the width of our grid is here, uh, whatever the height of the grid is, um, and then it'll just say place the agent at that location, much as we did before, but rather than the randomly chosen start cell, we'll give it the coordinate x, y. So just randomly pick a, a, an x, y coordinate to put them. So try putting them in an empty cell. If there aren't any left, though, just put them anywhere. So that's our constructor for our model class. Now we also need a step method um, for the model, much as we do for the agent. Each agent has its own step function that says in uh, every time it's your turn, this is what I want you to do. And we've just you've just written that. You've said, I want you to do this. You might move, in which case you use your move function, and then you might infect other people, in which case you use your infect function and do all this stuff. But the model also needs a, a step function as well uh, to define what it's going to do at each time step. Um, and here, all it's going to do is step the, for, uh, the scheduler forward one time unit. And the scheduler, by doing that, will then say, OK, right, uh, all the agents I'm now going to, remember, we've got a random activation scheduler. So it'll just pick uh, an agent at random and say, you write your first stop this time, run your step method. Then it'll go to the next agent and say, your, your next stop, let's run your step method, etc." So all we need to do in our step method for the model here is just say, step the scheduler forward one step. So we just call the step method on the scheduler, which we call the schedule. That's it. That's our, our entire step method is that, are those two lines of code.
And that's it. That's the model. We've written the entire model there. We've written a, per, uh, a person agent class that defines what our person agents do. And we've written a model agent, uh, sorry, a model class that defines how the model work. That's all the core of the model. Everything we now do is just about running it and visualizing it. We've done all the hard work. So the second thing we're going to do now is to write what's called the run file. So we mentioned there were three files you want in a Mesa structure, the model, which has got most of the stuff. Then you've got the run module, which is a separate file that will tell it uh, which of the three ways uh, are you going to run it as a single run, a batch run, or using a server to visualize it? Which of those are you going to do? Let's set that up. And then maybe we've got a third module, the server module, if we're going to, which we are going to have here, um, which will define how we visualize it. So we've written the, the model module now. We're going to run the run, uh, uh, write the run module. Um, and uh, we're just going to run it for the moment using a server to visualize this stuff so we can see what it looks like. Okay. Now, the good news is that, that makes the run file very easy. This is our run file. All you need to do is copy and paste that piece of code. That's your run file. That's it. In fact, I will show you. There you go. That's your run file. It just basically, um, the only thing you'll need to change is uh, the uh, the name of your server module. So I've called mine disease. I've called mine disease model, disease run, and disease server for my three. Whatever you've called your server file, that's the the thing you need to put in there. Other than that, that that code will stand any time you want to run your module at uh, your model um, as a visualization on the server. Just use that. Just basically tells it to import a server. Uh, and uh, all the stuff we're about to write, do that, and then launch it. Okay, so that's it. Nice and easy. So let's move on to the server file. So uh, just to flag up, this this is different. If you wanted, if you weren't going to run a server, and you wanted to run it as a batch run, for example, which we come on to, um, then the run file would look slightly different. But here we don't need to do that. So we're going to write the server file now, because that's the way we've chosen to run it. We're going to run our model, and then we're going to watch it play out. We're going to see the grid and various other visualizations. So we're going to watch it run live. Uh, so we're going to write this, and I'm, I've called mine disease server.py. So the first thing we're going to do, switch back here, um, is we're going to import our uh, libraries that we're going to need. So the first library I'm going to need, the first module I'm going to need, is the disease model that I wrote. It needs one of those. Um, so uh, from disease model, that's my file here that I just wrote, import the class disease model, the model class that we've, we've literally just written. Import one of those. That's what it needs. It doesn't need the agent. It just needs the model. Remember, the model class will create the agents. Then we're going to import um, uh, from uh, mesa.visualization.modules. We're going to import um, canvas grid. Um, this is basically just the type of grid uh, visualization that we're going to use to visualize a grid on our screen. This is mostly what you will use. Uh, we're also going to import something called a modular server. Again, this is standard for what, what you'll, what you'll uh, need. Um, and we're also going to import um, uh, user settable parameters. Now, this basically allows us to create little user interface elements really easily. So we can set up little sliders as we're going to here so that the user can pick what values go into the model. So that's, those are our imports. Now, the first thing we need to do uh, when we're writing our um, server file is to write what's known as a portrayal function. And the portrayal uh, function is basically defining how your agents within your environment are going to be visualized or portrayed. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to set up our agents so that we draw them as circles on our grid with a radius of 0.5 and they're colored red if they're infected. Uh, if they're not infected, then they are smaller and they're gray. So small gray circles, not infected, big red circles, they are infected. Um, and because we're not going to set up, we're only doing a very simple visualization here. So we'll only be able to see 
they'll all be drawn in the same location so if you've got more than two agents you won't see them potentially you won't even see two um so uh, you can change that by the way uh if you look at the most documentation but um we're going to set it up so here so that uh, with the layer value which says which circle should be drawn on top of other circles um so we're going to say um that the uh the the small gray circles should go on top so if there's a small gray uninfected person and uh in the same cell as a large red circle which is an infected person the small gray one will go on top so we can see it okay, it's a really simple basic visualization and all we're going to do here is we're going to set it up um and we're going to set up uh, so we set up our portrayal function we pass in uh the agent because that's the thing that we want drawn so uh it takes an age this uh method will take an agent as an input then we set up the what's known as the portrayal dictionary remember dictionary is just key value pairs so the key is the kind of the uh the parameter value for that uh portrayal and then the value is what we want that value to be so here i'm setting up the shapes of the agents to be circles uh there's lots of these you can play around with them again you can have a look at the mesa documentation um filled just means are they filled circles or not um, and they are in this case and i'll have my standard um default size to be 0.5 for an agent as the radius but what i can also do say okay so that's what a standard agent looks like but I want them to be drawn slightly differently depending on certain properties. And here, specifically, I want to draw them differently depending on whether um, they are infected or not. So remember, our agent, the agent that's going to get passed into this is going to be the person agent that we wrote a moment ago. And that, age, that class has a, an attribute called infected that we set up. And we said it's true when they're infected and false when they're not. So we can say, when you go to draw one of our agents, check their infected attribute. And if that's true, then draw them like this. Otherwise, draw them like this. So here it's saying, if, they're, if they are infected, then set the color to be red and set the layer um, to be uh, zero. Uh, the lower the layer value, the lower down they are. So higher layer values go on top. If they're not infected, then I want the color to be gray. I'm going to change the radius from the default 0.5. This is for, this is kind of the default. From the default of 0.5, I want to make those 0.2, so they'll be smaller. And the layer will be one, so they'll appear on top. So we've got big red circles on the bottom and little gray circles on the top. Big red circles mean infected uh, agent. Uh, little gray circles mean uninfected agent. Very simple visualization. Then we uh, need to set up our um, uh, elements that will make up our visualization. Uh, we're just gonna set up for now, um, we're just gonna set one element in our visualization, which will be, I want you to visualize the grid in which our agents are moving around. Um, and so we're gonna set that up as a canvas grid remember that's one of those things we imported we're going to pass into that the a portrayal function which is the thing we just wrote we called agent portrayal so that will tell it how to draw agents on our grid and then we're going to specify that the grid will have 10 by 10 cells uh and it'll be 500 by 500 pixels so that will the uh, pixel count will defi define how large it is on our on our screen essentially Now, uh, Mesa, one of the really nice features of Mesa is it allows us to really easily add this user interface stuff so that we can have little sliders and other stuff um, so that the user can play around with the, the parameters of the model and see what difference it makes. So we're going to add five sliders in this case to our, to our model. Again, there's other um, interface elements you can put in, but we're just going to have little sliders here, probably the most common one for this kind of model. So we're going to allow the user to specify the total number of agents that we've got in the model, the probability that an agent's infected at the start of the model, uh, the transmissibility of the disease. Remember, that's the probability that an agent, if they're in the same cell as another agent, will infect them 
per time step. The level of movement, remember that's the probability that an agent moves on any given time step, and the mean length of the disease duration. So all of that stuff that you were thinking, where, where is all that information coming from? It's going to come from here. We're going to set up sliders, and when we run the model, the user can specify, they'll have defaults, but uh, the user can specify uh, um, what those values will actually be. So uh, for each user set all parameter, which is um, uh, going to be all going to be sliders in this case. Um, we're going to specify the type of the, uh, so we need to give it a name. We set up that parameter. Uh, we specify the type, which the, as I said, they'll all be sliders. Uh, and then we'll give it, so let's take the first one here. So we're going to have a slider set up for the number of agents. So the user can uh, play around with the slider and say how many agents they want in the model. So I'm going to call that number of agents slider. So I can refer to it. Um, I set that up as a user settable parameter. I tell it what type of interface element it is, as though they're all sliders here. So just say slider. Then I give the text, uh, which is the label that this is going to be next to the slider to tell the user what it is. So in this case, number of agents, so they know what they're changing. Then I'm going to pass in some values. So the first value here is the default. So if the user at the start, if the user does nothing, there will be 20 agents in the model. They do nothing else. Then I specify the minimum value that I will allow the user to select. So in this case, I specified a value of two because a disease uh, spread model with only one person is a pretty boring disease spread model because the disease can't spread. You have to have at least two agents in order to make that interesting. So there's no point allowing them to have a one person model. So we'll set the minimum at two. Uh, and I'm also going to set a maximum uh, so they can have up to 100 if they want, up to 100 um, agents. And this fourth value here uh, specifies the increment. So every time they, they go across a notch on the slider, that's how much it'll change. So this says, give me a slider that will set up the number of agents um, and the default value will be 20. Uh, the minimum value will be two, the maximum value will be 100, and you can the user can change it in increments of one. Obviously, we don't want anything less than one because um, we don't want them to select half an agent because that won't work. And then we do the same for the other things. So here I've got an initial infection slider. Um, that's going to have a piece of text saying probability of initial infection. The default will be 30%. Uh, so by default, 30% of our, roughly 30% of our, um, agents at the start of the model will be infected. I'll let you go down to um, 1%. The maximum is 100% is one, because you can't have more than that. Um, and they can change it in increments of 1%. And then I've done the same for all of these things, the so transmissibility, the level of movement, the mean length of disease, etc. So they can play around with this stuff. So we just set up for each, uh, for each uh, slider that we want, we give it the type of the um, interface element, in this case, it's slider, the text we want next to that slider, and then default, minimum, maximum, increment values. Then the final step is to set up the server itself. And this is going to be the server that then gets launched when we run the run file. That those three lines of code, this is the thing it's going to, that's what that three line of code, the three lines of code are going to do. It's going to launch this thing. Okay. So um, here we set up a new server. It's a modular server. Remember, we, we imported that at the start of this file. And we're going to pass in the name of the model. That's the our model class. We remember we called ours disease model. We imported it here. Then we're going to pass in a list of the elements we want to visualize. Now, at the moment, we've just got one element to visualize, and that's the grid. Um, but you can use this, as you'll see, to set up graphs and all sorts. But at the moment, we just want to visualize the grid in which they're going to live. So it's just, but you still have to pass it in as a list, even if there's only one thing. So here it's the grid. Remember, we set up the grid up above and we called it grid. Um, then I'm going to give it a, a pass in a title. That'll be the title on our window. I've just called mine disease spread model. Then I'm going to pass in um, a dictionary that's going to, this is where, because you're probably thinking, how on earth does it know to pass in those slider values to your model. This is where it does it. Okay, so here is where you link the sliders with this is the value, this slider uh, 
corresponds to this value in the model. And Mesa does all this for you. Um, so here, uh, remember, we pass into, in our model class, we say it's going to accept a value called n, which will represent the number of agents. Here we say the key is whatever we've we said we'll pass into it, n in this case. And then the value is uh, the name of the interface element, in this case, the, sli the name of the slider that's going to set that up. So we just need to do this, and that will say whatever number um, the user has chosen on that slider, pass that in as n. Pass in initial infection as whatever's on that slider. Transmissibility is whatever's on that slider, etc. Width and height, we're not allowing the user to select those things, so we're going to hard code those as uh, 10 by 10. But you could, you could set up sliders for that as well if you wanted. So we just pass that in as a dictionary. So let's have a look at the, the, the server file. So we've done our imports up here. We then specify a portrayal function, which says, this is how, if I pass you an agent, this is how I want you to draw them. Then we set up our visualization elements. At the moment, we've just got one. I've just called it grid, which is going to draw. Uh, we said it's a canvas grid that's going to use that portrayal function I've just written up above. And it'll be 10 by 10 cells, and it'll be 500 by 500 pixels. Then I set up any user interface elements. So I've got five sliders set up. And then I set up the server with all that information. I give it the model. I give it the list of elements that I want to draw. In this case, just a grid, the title, and then a dictionary linking the uh, user interface elements to the things that needs to pass in and also hard coding anything that you, the user isn't uh, able to select. So width and height are the other things when we said you create a new model. Um, we said it will pass in a width and height. This is where we'll pass in width and height. Okay. We're ready to run. So we're going to run the model now. And we do that by running the run file, the, um, we, we, which we call disease run.py. That will then start up the server that we've just created. And that server, remember, imports the model class that we wrote and that model class creates the agents so the run class calls the server which then starts up the model which then creates the agents so it's a snowballing effect so i'm gonna um uh, launch it here and then i'll give you a bit of time to to have a play around with it uh, yourself um so let me run this so we go to disease run push f5 Hopefully this will come up okay. Give it a second to boot up. There we go. This is our model. So we've set this up. That's the title I wrote, disease spread model. Here's that about button. If I click that, there you go. That's what I wrote in that triple quotation mark stuff in the start of the model class. Then we've got some buttons up here, uh, start, step, and reset. Start starts the model running. Step runs the model for one time step. So you can keep you can uh, view it one time set at a time and reset resets the model now resets quite important because if you change any of these values then you need to hit reset for them to kick in uh, you'll also get this slider up here which always gets included uh, which shows you that it's the number of frames per second so you can you can change the speed at which you're you're viewing this so you can see these uh, initial values here so let's uh let's well let's start that running See what happens. So just with the defaults, I'll click start. We've got some agents who are infected in red. We've got some agents who are not in gray. So let's click start, see what happens. We see our agents moving around. We see infected agents starting to infect other agents. And we gradually see this sort of pattern emerging. Now, what you tend to find is with those default values, tends to die out. We've only got one infected left. That one's probably going to, unless it infects another one pretty soon. Oh, we did, I think. Um, th it tends to die out pretty quickly. Um, so we're on uh, day 82 and it's gone. So now we've got no infected agents and there's no way for the infection to come back in our model. Um, we haven't set up anything like that. So I can stop that. But I can play around with this. So if I were to put in more people, maybe increase the probability that they're initially infected, maybe increase the transmissibility a little bit, maybe increase the level of movement so people are more inclined to move, and maybe just extend the length of the disease a little bit, click reset, 
click start now and we'll find that the uh, the disease as you would expect um doesn't peter out quite so quickly because we've changed things so you can already see this is starting to move towards a, 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 a where you could use what if analysis where you could say something like okay well what if we reduce the level of movement how will that help us um and you know in comparison to uh free movement how much do we need to cut it to really get things down at the moment we're not really capturing any results we'll come on to that uh, at the moment we're just looking at what's happening but you can see there's a, there's a definite difference here uh when we when we've done that okay So what I'll get you to do now is uh, have a look through. So we'll give you about, um, so I'm going to run today until five. I won't go till half five. So we'll, we'll get through um, as much as we can. I'm just going to give you 10 minutes just to go off and have a little play in your groups. Um, hopefully this may not work for all of you because the, you're starting up a server. So you may have firewall issues. Hopefully one of you though will be able to get it working. Um, have a look at the code in the disease run which is pretty minimal, uh, but more importantly, the disease server uh, pi file. Make sure you understand how that's working. Then run the file, and then just have a little play around. Remember, you have to click reset uh, at the uh, whenever you change any values. Um, if you close the model, and then you want to launch it again, you'll have to restart the kernel uh, because the port will still be open. We haven't told it to close. Um, so remember how to restart your, your kernel in Spider. I'm going to say you might have issues depending on uh, uh, whether your how your firewall set up. So be aware of that. Um, of course, you know which ports you need them to unblock uh, because we wrote it. Uh, where is it? No, here. That's the port <laughs> eight five two one. Uh, so if IT ask, that's the one you need unblocked uh, for your firewall. Okay, so we'll just uh, give you ten minutes, and then I'll just um, uh, go over some some last stuff before we close uh, for the day. Okay, let me open up the rooms. Hi everyone. Okay, so um, yeah, I just want to give you a bit of a chance to play with that. Um, and uh, also uh, just give you a bit of a glimpse, um, particularly as one of the questions came up um, in the chat around, um, could we model kind of immunization and vaccination? And uh, yes, you can. In fact, I've supplied you with the code um, to do that. So we'll just have a, a very quick look at that um, for those who, who didn't get that far. Um, but also um, uh, uh, we'll close off today just by showing you um, uh, the, the principle of how you would create these kind of dynamic graphs um, that you see in this. Uh, and then I'll give you a chance to have a look at the code in, 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 in more depth um, yourselves. Uh, so if I uh, share my screen, Okay, so this is, um, you've got a, a folder that says um, disease spread, um, no, what's it called? Disease model with immunization. So here um, uh, is a version of the same model, um, but with some extra bells and whistles. So um, we've basically modeled here this concept that um, people may become immunized probably through vaccination. Um, and there's a probability that uh, on any time step that uh, an agent will become immunized vaccinated perhaps um and you can play around with that in the slider the prob that probability and also um uh, the kind of average length of immunization that's how long that immunity uh, then lasts before they can get uh, and while they're immune they can't be uh, reinfected um and uh we've set it up so that little blue circles come up on here uh, indicating um uh which ones are immune uh, and so if we play around with that we can have um uh, some more people immunized, uh, set up the length of the uh, um, uh, the immunization. Uh, if I reset and push start, we can see we get little blue circles here, people getting immunized. And in fact, this is going to die out pretty quickly by the look of it. We've got one infected person moving and then it's gone. Now down here, we see this dynamic graph uh, where we can track both the total number of infected and the total number um, uh, immunized over time. And um, we see very quickly there that uh, we got to a position where um, they were uh, quickly getting uh, powerfully immunized. Um, but let's put up the number of agents, the probability of initial infection, transmissibility, let's make this much worse. 
expand the length of the disease, uh, reset that. So now we've got a lot of infected people and we're going to start our vaccination campaign. Uh, so we're starting to get um, uh, people who are uh, immune to it. And we can watch the points at which um, uh, this graph, and it's really nice, these dynamic graphs in Mesa that allow us to uh, automatically monitor um, these pieces of data over time. So we can see here, gradually, even with this very dense um, population with a lot of people infected, um, gradually we're chipping away at the total number of people who are infected and uh, the uh, the immunity is, is winning out. We can see that's gradually up here, we're starting to see that, that effect too. So even with a very dense um, um, period here, we can see that, uh, oh, sorry, very dense population, we can see actually in this setup, we're getting pretty decent results. Um, and we can play around with that. And of course, this is starting to get towards a model where you could say, okay, well, what kind of vaccination rates do we need to hit? Uh, what, what, you know, if the length of the uh, immunity to the disease is this, uh, what, what do we need to do? How do we also then need to combine that with curbing level of movement? Um, uh, you know, all this kind of stuff that we can then uh, start to play around with. And it's uh, starting to hopefully show you uh, how you can use these kind of agent-based models uh, to answer these kind of questions. Remember, all of these agents are just doing their move, uh, infect, uh, behaviors uh, at an individual level, but we're seeing these population level um, dynamics um, starting to emerge. Um, uh, and if anybody else is thinking of zombies, by the way, when this comes in, you're not alone. Uh, a common uh, 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 scenario for modeling agent-based simulations is to use the concept of zombies. And in fact, you can set up your model so that uh, your agents are trying to run away from the zombies. Um, and uh, you can play around with parameters such as, you know, what what at what speed uh, do the uh, zombies become problematic uh, um, and your population starts to become uh, all zombies? Uh, you know, where do you need to vaccinate against your zombies? Uh, all sorts of stuff that you can do. So not just disease spread, you can do zombies too. Um, so just for the, because uh, uh, I don't want to run late tonight. Um, so I'm just going to very quickly go over the concepts for generating one of these graphs. And you've got the code um, where you can have a look um, at this um, in your own time to see how it, how it's done too. Um, basically, in order to do it, we're going to use something uh, called a data collector. Remember, um, right back at the start, uh, we in our first model file, we imported something called a data collector. Um, we're now going to use it. And basically, data collectors are just things that we can use in Mesa that allow us to collate results over the course of a model. Um, and uh, easily visualize them uh, on a graph. Um, so to do that, uh, we write uh, a, a little function um, that will monitor, uh, in this case, we're gonna use it to monitor the total number of infected agents over time. We will then use that same principle for the um, uh, immunity as well. Um, so uh, we'll calculate, um, uh, we'll write this function that will do that for us uh, as a standalone function um, in, the, uh, in the module. Um, and that will basically, so this is what I was going to get you to do as an exercise, but um, I'll just talk you through it instead. So basically, the function will accept a Mesa model object. And then for that Mesa model object, it'll set up a, a counter. In fact, let me show you the code. That would be easier. I'm going to try and talk through it here. Uh, I will come out of the vaccination uh, immunization version. I'll just show you the one without that. Um, so... The order to look at this is disease model as your first one, um, then look at uh, disease model with data collectors, um, then batch runner, and then, well, sorry, then immunization, then batch runner. Um, we normally skip over the immunization one though. Uh, but let me just open up the data collector one so you can see this. This won't have immunization because we didn't put that in originally. But these, so this, you'll recognize the agent and the model class uh, are exactly as they were before. This is the new function. So we've just written it as a standalone function in our model file. It's not part of the classes at all. I've just called it calculate number infected. And all I've done here, set up a, a counter with a default value of zero. Um, that's going to keep count of how many are infected. Um, and then I just use a little simple list comprehension here to say, uh, give me an infection report. So grab me the infected uh, uh, attribute for each agent in the schedule. Then go through each agent. And if they're infected, increment that counter by one and return that number. Uh, of course, you could do this as a single um, list comprehension here. You could put in a condition, piece of conditional logic and say only grab me agents who are infected 
where their infected uh, attribute is true and then just return the length of that list would be a more elegant way to do that. But that's all this is doing. It's just going to basically grab the list of agents. Uh, it'll, um, uh, sorry, it's not grabbing the list of agents. It's grabbing a list of uh, trues and falses representing whether they're infected or not. Uh, and then it'll count how many trues it finds and return that. So at any point of the model, we can keep track how many people are infected. Okay. Um, so we we write that function. Then all we need to do is set up the data collector itself and specify um, that the function that we've just written, that one that I just took you through there, uh, as one of the what's called model reporters. You can have things called agent reporters too. Most of you use uh, model reporters, um, but because uh, it's a model wide thing that you're looking at. Um, so basically, at the end of the constructor in the disease model, we just insert this little bit of code. We say set up a new data collector, store it as a data collector stored against the model, and then we list uh, any model reporters and agent reporters we've got. We haven't got any agent reporters, um, but we're going to have a model reporter here, and we set it up as a dictionary. We say um, it's I want you to use this method, uh, this function, the one we've just written, uh, and that will report this value, total infected. Okay, now whatever you write in here is quite important because we're going to link to that in the graph. So I'm going to call this thing total infected and the way you're going to calculate that is using this function. So at every time step in the model, uh, we'll call this function or the data collector will, will then collect the data by doing what we've just told it to, grabbing the trues and falses, counting up how many true and reporting that back. So we need to tell it to do that. Uh, so before in the models step function, we just had uh, self.schedule.step. We just told it to step the schedule forward one, uh, one time. Uh, but we're additionally now, because we've got a data collector, we're gonna tell the data collector to collect some data. In fact, all of the data collectors to, uh, to collect their data. Um, and so here, what it'll do is it'll uh, report back here and say, okay, I need to run this method which is the one we just uh, we just uh, wrote um, to grab the number of um, uh, infected, and the data collector will handle that over over the course of your model run. So once we've done that, we can then just uh, put it out as a graph. So we go into our disease server file to do that. Um, we're going to import an extra thing uh, called a chart module, which allows us to draw charts graphs. Um, we're going to set up uh, uh, where before we had, uh, we set up a grid to draw our grid of cells. We're also going to set up now a graph as well, which will be one of these chart module things that we've just imported. Um, we're setting up um, with uh, just one line on the graph at the moment. Obviously, you've just seen an example with the immunization model where you'll have two lines plotted on the same graph. You can see how you do it here. Uh, but for, for this one, we're just looking at total infected. We set up the label as being total infected. So that's the uh, the um, uh, name that we gave to the data collector. We said, use this function that we've written to get that number. And that's the, the name of the result. And that name of the result, total infected, is the thing I'm passing in here. That's the thing I want the, the server now to plot. Um, and I'm going to set up the color to be red. Uh, the color of the line uh, and the name of the data collector that, that you're going to grab all this from is data collector. And then the, the only other thing we then need to do is where we set up the server. Remember, we in the first instance, we passed in uh, a list of um, elements that we wanted to visualize. And in the first example, we just passed in a list that contains grid. That was the only thing we had visualized. Here, we just also say, oh, and by the way, we also want this thing, the total infected graph that we've just defined up above. So if we have a look at um, the code there, uh, we can see uh, here, so we're under where we set up the grid, here's where we set up the graph, uh, up here, and then down in the server, here's where we pass that in to say, I want you to visualize that too. And similarly, uh, when we're collecting extra data, um, uh, when we get into the immunized one, we just set up another function that counts the number of immunized, get it to collect that too, uh, and get it to plot that. 
here and we just plot it as a blue line on our graph as an additional line. So it's actually really easy uh, to uh, to add all this uh, stuff in. Um, so I'd advise, um, I whipped through that pretty quick, I'd advise having a look at that uh, yourselves to see how, how, how you do that. As they have a look at the uh, disease model with, um, uh, which one was it? Disease model with data collectors. So that's the version that you've been working on initially, but with this data collector that will monitor uh, the total number of infected over time. Then I'd advise you to have a look at um, a disease model with uh, immunization, which will uh, add in that immunization thing. Um, when we come on to the next session, uh, we'll cover the batch running uh, initially. So hopefully, um, I'll, I'll let you know tomorrow, but hopefully we'll get it set up um, for next Tuesday afternoon, um, if that works for people. I know it won't work for everyone, and apologies if you're on leave. Um, I wanted to get through this afternoon to try and uh, get, give you most of the teaching. What you, If you can join us next uh, Tuesday afternoon, what we'll do, I'll talk a little bit about the batch runner, which rather than model it as um, a server where you're watching it all play out, um, you can then just change your run file and say, actually, I want you to run it in batch and I want you to try all of these combinations of uh, parameter values um, and uh, go away and do them and give me the, the results back in a pandas data frame and then I can and it's really easy to do that in Mesa uh, so we'll show you how to do that but then most of the session you're going to have a go in your groups at, at having uh, coming up with a an agent based model and writing it in Mesa I know a number of you last week with the selling automata started to get into um, a lot of your ideas would have made really good agent based simulations but you were constricted by the cellular automata framework. As you can see now, that isn't the case. Um, and also I know a number of you actually wanted to write these things. Well, now we've given you the tools to do it. Um, so uh, in next week's session, we'll talk a little bit about batch runners, um, but uh, you'll then have a chance to write your own, design and write your own agent-based simulation uh, using Mesa. Okay, we'll stop there. Um, because that's quite a bit that we've we've uh, we've gone through today. Uh, so uh, apologies for this morning once again. Um, uh, hopefully we've managed to rattle through uh, most of it um, and uh, given you a sense about how this stuff uh, can be used. Um, I, I, again, I think it would be really nice to see uh, an agent-based simulation project um, in HSMA. Um, I, I think there's a lot of potential for it. And I think it makes something really interesting. And hopefully you can see Mesa is a really nice package to use and you can get this really nice visualization stuff out of it really easily. Uh, and it gives you so much flexibility to be able to do uh, whatever you like pretty much um, with this stuff. Um, so do have a think about if there are uh, things you can do. And if you can join us uh, next Tuesday afternoon, uh, we'll have a bit of a light session uh, uh, the final session before Christmas where you can have a practice and, and play around with Mesa and try and write these things. So do join us uh, if you can. Brilliant. I will stop there. Um, thank you very much for coming along everyone today and uh, hopefully see some of you at least next week. Cheers everyone. Thank bye you, bye. John.